Hi, I'm Jared Sando, and I'm really excited to present this special event for you. I was lucky enough to sit down with Associate Professor Nikolai Slavov of Northeastern University to discuss single cell proteomics and the great work that he is pioneering for the global scientific community. During our chat, Nikolai shared some terrific insights about recent technological advances, some of the current challenges facing scientists, and the future of the field. We hope that you really enjoy this enlightening interview. Welcome, Nikolai. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. It's a real honor to be talking to you. To start us off, can you tell us a bit about you, your lab and research, and in particular, what attracted you to focus on proteomics, and in particular, the field of single cell proteomics? Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to, uh, to discuss those topics with you. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that is very important for me in terms of the research topics that we choose is to make non-redundant contributions, which means that I like to do work that perhaps will not happen now or it will happen later in, uh, in, in the future unless we help, uh, help give it a push in that direction. And about five, six years ago when I started my lab, I felt that the field of single cell proteomics by mass spectrometry was in that position that uh, the technology created the capability to do this kind of analysis, while at the time that wasn't as actively developed and recognized. And I liked the challenge. I felt that uh, uh, this kind of analysis will be both feasible and also very fruitful in terms of the biological questions that we can answer with it and the insights that we can obtain. Uh, so I assembled a small crew of, of colleagues and undergraduate students at the beginning to, to help me uh, with the initial experiments in quantifying proteins in single mammalian cells. And for the most part, these experiments worked better than expected. We, we had early promising results and we kept going in that direction. But um, going back to your, to your bigger question in terms of the research in my group at the moment, we obviously uh, focus quite a bit on developing methods for uh, single cell proteomics by mass spectrometry. Uh, and as these methods mature and become more uh, powerful, we are increasingly applying them to various biological problems. And in particular, we, we have projects that uh, use the technology to map uh, protein abundances in, in, in 3D at single cell resolution in healthy and diseased human tissues, which is more on the descriptive side of things. And we also have projects that are leveraging the power of single cell proteomics to, to identify molecular mechanisms that, that regulate biological functions. We are also broadly interested in post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms, not necessarily and only uh, studied at single cell level. We are also interested in ribosome modifications that can regulate uh, protein synthesis. Mm. Yeah, well, it was, uh, it was really exciting to see, I guess you, you've talked about uh, being a pioneer in some of these method developments. It, it was really exciting to see the, the recent publication on, on your scope two paper uh, titled Single Cell Proteomics and Transcriptomic Analysis of Macrophage Heterogeneity Using Scope Two, uh, published in Genome Biology. Um, I'd also like to note that, uh, that we noticed that the first author, Harrison Specht, was also listed in the Journal of Protein Research as a, as a rising star in proteomics. So I guess speaking to the, you know, the quality of the group that you've managed to assemble. So congratulations to you both. Um, can you give us a little bit more uh, information and, and run through this paper, this techniques, and, and what are some of the important insights that you uh, discovered during this process? Thank you. So the, the paper has two components. One is the development and improvement of the original methodology that we came up for quantifying proteins in single cells. And the other is the application to an important biological problem. And I see the two as being intricately connected because uh, the utility of a method is best demonstrated on the field when applied to, to a real problem. Uh, so, on the side of method improvement, uh, the, the overall uh, increase in accuracy and throughput is very significant. 
uh, on the order of some steps as much as a hundredfold, such as the, the decrease in cost for sample preparation and increase in, in throughput. And, and some parts are tenfold improved as, as accuracy and, and so on. And these improvements came from a lot of components that interacted synergistically. Uh, some of the significant improvements include uh, sample preparation, as I already mentioned. We replaced the original uh, cell lysis by a focused acoustic sonication with a heat uh, with a uh, heat freeze step or freeze heat step, which we spent a lot of time validating and making sure that we can apply in a parallel manner to efficiently extract proteins for a mass spectrometry analysis. Uh, we completely automated the uh, sample preparation in the sense that uh, uh, protein digestion and peptide labeling and pooling and all of these steps can be performed by liquid handler rather than manually as we used to do. And this both increases the throughput, but also can add a layer of reproducibility and standardization because the quality of samples is less dependent on the person who is preparing them. Uh, equally important is the improvement in the liquid chromatography, the front end of the instrument. Uh, and there we, we've used your analytical columns, which allowed us to obtain a very high uh, performance separation of, of peptides and efficient delivery, efficient ionization into the, ins into the instrument. And, and that part for us actually took a while because initially we did not start using ion optics columns. We started using uh, a variety of different columns and the, the results weren't so great. Um, with, with some columns, interestingly, some commercial columns, we were able to obtain very, very good results when using highly purified uh, standards and, uh, pep and peptides but those same columns resulted in very poor results when used with real samples that have not been cleaned up. Um, and we also packed in-house columns, but I strongly preferred to use a commercial um, option because that would make the method uh, much more easy for other groups to adopt, to be, to be standardized. And uh, one of the advantages also for our own internal use has been the extremely high degree of reproducibility of uh, retention times and performance between different batches of ion optics columns. Uh, another good um, commercial option that we encountered in that process was uh, pharmafluidics. We used their columns as well uh, and, and their reasonable option, but we obtained better results with ion optics and also considering the, the lower price that, that was a decisive consideration for us to, to keep using them. And of course, we made some changes in, in data acquisition methods and, uh, and uh, the analysis and interpretation of the mass spectrometry data. Again, coming back to retention times, we were able to leverage the very high accuracy of retention times uh, as additional feature to, to increase confidence in correct peptide identifications and um, reduce confidence in incorrect ones. So that's on the side of the method, probably in more details than uh, you anticipate. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I guess I'm interested, in fact, in, in delving a little bit more into the method. Um, you know, as an emerging field with single cell proteomics, there's, there's a number of methods that are being proposed by a variety of, of research groups at the moment. What do you think makes the, the scope two method stand out from the, the crowd um, when compared to sort of the other alternatives that are being proposed at the moment? So another category of methods is performing label free analysis, analyzing one cell at a time. And uh, when, I, when I see the promising results in that, in that field, my first reaction is to think that this is uh, a great technical feat to achieve that level of sensitivity. Uh, but the flip side of, of those technical marvels is the lower throughput of analysis, uh, because only a single cell is analyzed at a time. Uh, the, the total number of cells that can be analyzed per unit time is, is fewer. 
And the cost per cell is substantially higher because most of the expense associated with single cell protein analysis with either our methods or other methods is instrument time, mass spec time spent in the analysis. Uh, so one, one aspect of, of the of scope method and the methods we've developed of scope MS is the uh, high throughput afforded by multiplexing as compared to the label free approaches. Another aspect is the affordability of, of the method in terms of uh, uh, using only commercial equipment that is relatively inexpensive when, a, when compared to some of the other methods that uh, use uh, instrumentation that is not commercially available and therefore uh, more difficult to, to reproduce. Uh, so uh, I think the methods that we, uh, we develop are relatively easy to, to adopt and be widely used and that's not a coincidence. That's in fact uh, a very important feature that um, has always motivated our efforts at, at various branch points when we had to make a decision, do we go for high performance or do we continue to emphasize methods that are likely to be robust and um, widely reproducible by other groups? We've always chosen the option of uh, robustness and broad accessibility because I think that for single cell proteomics to have a broad impact, it has to be applied broadly by many groups, not a few groups that are interested in method development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually interested in, in a little bit more of the biology as well that was uh, contained within the, the scope two paper. I was really interested to see that, you know, you sort of demonstrated that, that macrophage populations that were actually previously thought to be, be quite distinct actually exist across a spectrum um, when, you, when you use your, your single cell um, techniques. How prevalent do you think this is, this sort of mischaracterization of, of cell populations is in the literature? Um, just because the tools previously weren't available, people have relied on flow cytometry or you know, even single cell RNA uh, techniques to define these populations instead of something like single cell proteomics. I think there are, there are many examples of people having assumed that they're discrete populations then having isolated cells based on a few markers into discrete populations and having found that the data indeed confirms their assumption that they're discrete populations. Unfortunately, when, when one performs this kind of analysis, there is no way to um, reject the incorrect assumption of discrete populations because by design, one measures uh, discrete subgroups of cells. Now, in the case of macrophages, it wasn't entirely a surprise that um, there is a spectrum of polarization. While traditionally macrophages have been uh, studied in, uh, in two extreme classes of be either being classically activated or M1 uh, type macrophages, which are inflammatory or alternatively, alternatively activated or M2 macrophages, which tend to be anti-inflammatory. In reality, it, it was known before our work that uh, macrophage polarization is more complex. And that complexity of the polarization is indeed very important in a variety of clinical settings and relates to the diverse biological functions that the cells have. What we found that wasn't known and we did not expect is that this kind of polarization into a continuum spectrum occurred even in the absence of polarizing cytokines. Uh, it occurred when we started from clonal cell population uh, of cells growing in more or less homogeneous conditions, giving rise to this continuous spectrum of polarized states, which actually happened to correlate quite well to, to previously defined M1 and 2 axis of polarization. But they did form a continuum in, in a way that we could have never identified without performing single cell protein analysis. Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm really interested to hear that, you know, describing something like flow cytometry to, to define cell populations where you go in with a preconceived idea and, you know, sort of unsurprising that you find that the two distinct populations or three or however, however many, you know, I mean, now that we have uh, harnessing the power of single cell proteomics, where do you see some of these established techniques, you know, flow cytometry, cytof, uh, technologies like that, 
that, that are limited by the number of event things they can sample uh, per cell. You know, where, where is the future for those given the, the techniques that we're currently developing? I think they can be applied more to clinical settings, not so much to uh, the discovery phase where having a method with uh, much deeper coverage, less biased coverage can enable new discoveries for which we did not have prior hypothesis. But when it comes to analyzing predefined markers at, uh, in, in a higher number of cells, I think one can still use the antibody-based approaches, especially where, when highly specific antibodies are available, which unfortunately is not commonly the case. Uh, it also tends to be more frequently the case with surface proteins uh, because they have received more attention uh, in terms of antibody development and uh, they're less affected by the molecular crowding problem associated with introducing antibodies for intracellular proteins. Uh, so these methods have traditionally played important role and they think they will continue to, to play a role in various contexts. But certainly the power of unbiased uh, quantification of many thousands of, of molecules has been well illustrated by uh, single cell RNA sequencing methods recently. And there is a lot of interest, uh, certainly in industry, in, in big pharma, uh, in a number of companies with which I interact, including Merck, Sanofi, and, and others. There is a very significant interest in being able to perform large-scale unbiased protein analysis in single cells. Yeah, I mean, I guess thinking some, somewhat more about, about scale, you know, one of the advantages of, of things like flow cytometry and, and I guess increasingly single cell RNA sequencing is the ability to analyze thousands of cells, tens of thousands of cells in quite a short space of time. Um, you know, when do you think we will be in that sort of level in, in a, the proteomics field where, where we can characterize these enormous populations of cells and, and pull out very discrete and small populations out of, out of those tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of cells? So if we think if we think of single cell RNA sequencing methods, they there is a spectrum in terms of their capabilities. There are methods that are very good at analyzing large number of cells, but they do that by sacrificing capture efficiency and the number of copies from messenger RNAs that are being detected per gene and number of genes detected. And there are the multi well plate based methods that have higher capture efficiency and lower throughput. And to some degree with mass spectrometry, I can see a similar trade-off with methods that use shorter acquisition times that might be able to analyze more cells, uh, but quantify fewer proteins. And conversely, methods that are more time consuming that have higher depth of coverage. Uh, at the moment, we are able to analyze about um, 200 single cells per instrument per day. So in the course of a couple of weeks, even on a single instrument, we can, gener we can analyze a few thousand single cells. And I think at, at this point, we can already uh, use the data for a lot of interesting biological experiments, in initial exploration. I have no doubt that throughput will continue to increase. Uh, and I think one prominent avenue for that to happen is by increasing multiplexing capabilities. Uh, to some extent, single cell protein analysis might be a primary uh, driving force for that because it provides compelling motivation for increasing the, the multiplexing and the capabilities there. It's not trivial to do it, but it's possible. And I believe that will happen. Uh, and it's very good to think of ways in which we can do that, perhaps shortening also the uh, duration of um, separation so that we can analyze larger number of, of um, sets per unit time. Uh, but what I think we have to realize and I want to emphasize is that even with the current throughput, which is more limited than that of single cell RNA sequencing, we can still analyze at reasonable in reasonable time and at reasonable cost uh, many thousands of single cells and we are ready to apply these methods for to, to uh, biology and biomedical questions not just for um, uh, method development and, and technology oriented purposes mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, when developing these new technologies, these new methods, um, you can really only dream of the impact it might help have on biology, on the community, on human health. Um, where do you think the end game is for this technology? You know, where, where does the, you know, what, what is the sky's the limit type approach? Yeah. One, one very challenging long-term long goal is to use these data to identify molecular interactions uh, and, me and mechanisms with fewer assumptions. So let me step back to first uh, describe what the problem is and then how single cell protein analysis might help with that. Uh, we have a variety of methods in biomedical research that allow us to establish associations between diseases and molecules. Uh, and in some cases, even if we establish very confident causal associations, for example, between a DNA polymorphism and a disease such as diabetes, we have a very difficult time understanding what this means because the association is very indirect. It might be causal, but there are a hundred different molecular interactions between that DNA polymorphism and the phenotype of interest. And therefore that causal association is consistent with close to infinite number of possible models. And that's a major hurdle to being able to, um, to develop therapies based on that observation. The advantage of being able to measure protein abundances across many, many single cells is that we can measure the molecules that are directly interacting with each other. And then we can condition these measurements that we have on possible confounders. For example, if we want to understand whether kinase I phosphorylates kinase J, we can quantify the activities of these kinases uh, across lots of lots of single cells, thinking of each single cell as representing a perturbation of a kind, as well as all of the other possible kinases that might be phosphorylating kinase I and J. And then we can condition so that we pick a subset of cells in which the other kinases do not change their activity and we just look at a section of the data at the activities of kinase I and J and ask whether the joint distribution of their activities is just a product of the marginal distributions or not. And the advantage of being able to do this kind of analysis is that we can, uh, we can determine uh, whether there is a direct interaction between these kinases, direct regulatory link, without needing to make any assumptions. Of course, to be able to do this type of analysis, we, we need to have highly quantitative data across uh, many single cells. And I think at this point, the, the, the data that we have uh, will, will be highly challenged to, to make those inferences with, with, high, with, with high confidence. But nonetheless, I think the potential is there in the longer term that uh, we'll be in the position of being able to make um, that kind of analysis. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, at the moment, we have focused on analyzing protein abundances in single cells because that's the entry level thing that is, access, uh, that is um, accessible. Uh, but much of the technology that is currently being developed is also going to generalize to many other types of analysis that we can do with mass spectrometry, such as direct measurements of protein protein interactions direct measurements of protein conformations, protein localization, and so on. Yeah, I guess um, it, it's interesting you mentioned sort of analysis as, as one of the great challenges of, of uh, looking at these large data sets that we're likely uh, to generate. Um, you're really well known and you know, active in the global community with your online lecture series where you, you actually walk through a lot of these uh, data sets and challenges that, that we face. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the motivations behind these initiatives um, and where people may be able to find out more? I am tremendously excited about the potential of mass spectrometry data to answer key pressing biological questions. And when I take a large scale 10,000 feet view of what are the challenges to realizing that potential, I see uh, a disconnect between the, uh, the questions that we ask, the data that are present and have the potential to answer them and the ability of, uh, of researchers to effectively analyze the data to, to answer their questions. 
uh, I think that there is uh, that there is need to explain uh, what are the strengths and the limitations of the existing data and how to properly analyze them with both simple and more sophisticated approaches so that we can make reliable inferences about the, the underlying biology. I have always felt that uh, the biomedical research community can, can benefit substantially more from mass spectrometry-based proteomics, metabolomics, if they understood better those technologies. And therefore, I, I, I try to provide an introduction to, to those technologies in, in a manner that I aim to make accessible and conceptual uh, so that I can maximize the benefit from, uh, from these really wonderful technologies for, for biomedical research. Uh, I, I try to do my best to reduce the jargon that it's inevitable part of, um, of, of all fields actually, uh, but nonetheless that jargon can be a significant impediment to taking full advantage and to of, of the available data, of the available methods. I know it was for me when I first transitioned from genomic systems biology to mass spectrometry I had a hard time reading a paper and understanding it because every sentence I had to look up a couple of terms that were confusing for me. And when somebody knows that terminology, they don't, we don't even notice it. Uh, we, we quickly understand it and we move on. Uh, but uh, I still remember the challenge that they had at the time. So now, um, I, uh, I record uh, short videos uh, that are uh, on specific focus topics. I try to make them uh, as self-contained as possible and as accessible as possible so that I can quickly introduce these topics to uh, interested students, interested researchers who may not have a lot of background in mass spectrometry so that uh, they can quickly get up to speed and know how to use uh, the technology and the available data for, for their research. All of the videos that they record uh, are on YouTube, so you can find them from our uh, YouTube channel um, or just Google for them, and hopefully uh, Google is going to give you a useful link. Um, it, it's interesting actually you talk about jargon and the approachability of some of these types of, of analyses. Um, I mean, I guess when I was uh, a younger researcher and you know in the same position trying to approach these, the, the proteomics research, it was actually sort of a one-stop shop. It was, you know, you did the sample prep, you ran the mass spec, you did the analysis of the sample and, and you handed it over to your collaborator. I mean, how long, you know, with these larger experimental constructs and large data size and, and complex questions, how long is that one-stop shop going to last? I think, are we going to just increasingly have to involve multiple people in, in a mass spectrometry experiment, a proteomics experiment, where a buy-in petition is, is always involved just to get the most out of some of these data sets that are being generated? Well, I think the people or the group of people, it can be a person, it can be a group of people, but the, uh, the people in charge of designing the experiment have to understand either at the level of the individual or at the level of the team, they, they have to understand all of the technical limitations and capabilities of mass spectrometry. And they, I frequently find that uh, even very well informed and brilliant uh, colleagues, leaders in, in biomedical research have misconceptions about mass spectrometry and they still think of mass spectrometry as perhaps being a semi-quantitative method at best, uh, something that perhaps was once upon a time the case, but they, they do not realize all of the strengths of current uh, methods. On the other hand, current methods do have weaknesses. They're not perfect. And one has to understand what these weaknesses are and how to circumvent them to, to design the experiment in an optimal way. So somehow we have to find a way to put together that um, uh, knowledge for all of the different aspects of the analysis, how the data will be analyzed, what will be the power of the study, how many samples we need, what kind of method to use, what are the trade-offs between having 
uh, lower depth of analysis versus more samples? What method we use? What is the difference between the accuracy of relative quantifications versus absolute? How being able to use um, uh, stable isotope uh, labeling approaches allows to cancel out nuisances due to variability in chromatography or ionization. Uh, all of these are very, very important things to know for designing an experiment in an optimal way. And while it is true that having all of that knowledge at once is, uh, is not commonplace, um, I think uh, if we are able to communicate it in a conceptual enough way, we can get closer to a situation where more and more people are able to design better and better experiments. And the more we can do that, the more we can max maximize what we learned from, from those experiments. So I think uh, in the best case scenario, we have uh, somebody who knows everything and designs perfect experiments and that is not going, it's not likely to happen. But the more we can approach it, the, uh, the more progress we're going to make. And I think part of that is finding a way to explain in conceptual ways, certain aspects of the work. Sometimes uh, some details are not essential. And it's knowing when to focus on those details and when those details can be skipped so that one can provide the essential information for designing the experiment. I think that kind of balance is very important to strike and can be quite helpful. Yeah, I guess additionally from a, from a different educational front, you're also a, a founder and an organizer of the annual single cell uh, proteomics conference that, that you host at Northeastern University. Um, how over the years has attendance and participation changed as the interest in the field grows from scientists, from, from vendors, from, from industry and, and pharma? Uh, that's a meeting that gives me a lot of delight. I enjoy organizing it. It's also time consuming, so it's not only pleasant, uh, uh, but uh, it is mostly pleasant for me. Uh, the meeting started uh, in 2018 and we had a group of uh, 16 brave, interested uh, colleagues who wanted to explore what this new field is going to be all about. And then since then, the, uh, the, size, the number of attendees have been doubling and tripling every year. Um, I, in, I very much enjoyed the in-person meetings that we had before COVID. And uh, with COVID, the meetings have become virtual. And this year, the meeting is going to be hybrid. It's going to be both in person and it's going to have a virtual component. And I actually do like the virtual component and perhaps we will keep that even after COVID because it allows um, people who are not able to travel uh, for various reasons to attend the conference and makes uh, the presentations more accessible, which of course is one of my primary motivations for organizing the meeting to make technology and progress accessible to as many people as they can. Uh, and this, this meeting also uh, uh, emphasizes my conviction that we need to have um, a better communication between different disciplines so that we can enable interdisciplinary research. So the meeting um, combines presentations from computational biologists, from experimental biologists, from mass spectrometrists, from systems biologists. And it's, uh, um, it's a wonderfully interdisciplinary meeting that uh, I certainly enjoy very much. And it's also a meeting that uh, provides ample of time for interactions. It is not intended to be a go to listen to um, meeting. Uh, after each presentation, we have 15 minutes for discussions. And usually uh, that time is not even enough because there are plenty of questions. We always use up the time. So uh, there, there are multiple slots throughout the day uh, where we specifically uh, engage the community in discussions and interactions. Uh, we also organize workshops as part of this meeting so that we can share details of uh, 
uh, experimental analysis or data analysis and uh, uh, provide a forum for exchanging what we have heard the what we have learned the hard way and what other colleagues have uh, learned the hard way to as many people as possible who can benefit from uh, that experience. Um, and as a means of uh, promoting it to the community, can you tell us when it's uh, been held to this year, the, the dates, and is there a specific theme for this year's conference? Uh, that actually will be the first time when I announce the, the change of dates uh, that will be announced this week uh, more formally and more broadly, but the meeting was planned for the beginning of June. But uh, because of the delays in COVID vaccination and because of my desire to maximize the in-person attendance, uh, I will ship the dates to August 17th and 18th. Uh, and the meeting will be held in person in Boston. It's always held uh, in, in person in Boston at Northeastern University. And it will have a virtual component that uh, all registered attendees can uh, can join and they usually cap the virtual attendance in, in the interest of allowing for more discussions uh, between the participants. Uh, but if you cannot join the, the meeting either in person or virtually, uh, you should be able to watch the recorded presentations of all speakers who agreed to record their presentations and post them on YouTube. That's that's one that's a tradition of the conference that uh, we always ask presenters whether uh, they're willing to share their presentations on YouTube and if they give us permission, we upload the, the presentations on YouTube. So actually, thinking more broadly about you know mass spectrometry, LCMS, um, what sort of te technological advances would you hope to see in the next? Five years. What do you think? You know, what are your frustrations right now? Um, you know, where do you think the, the field is going over the next next five years? Well, there are lots of things that can improve, but uh, I think increased multiplexing is going to uh, to help tremendously to to make the technology more accessible and make it higher throughput. Uh, it is common that the lower throughput of mass spectrometry limits the statistical power that we have for various biological analyses. And I don't imagine and I don't see a possible path to instruments becoming cheaper. They become more and more powerful, but not cheaper. So the only way to increase uh, throughput and make it more affordable is to decrease analysis time. And multiplexing is an obvious way to, to do that. Of course, we can also shorten the uh, active gradients to a degree, but multiplexing appears to provide a path to increase uh, throughput with fewer trade-offs. So, and, and that's certainly something that can be tremendously helpful for mass for single cell analysis as well. Uh, there, there are certainly many advances on the side of, in, of instrumentation, increasing the uh, resolution, as, which is especially important for, for top-down uh, and increasing speed of analysis. But I think what is probably um, even more limiting and more important to improve is the front end of the analysis, improving the robustness of separation and ionization. Uh, at the moment, one of the major um, uh, limits of our sensitivity is the efficiency of ionization and the fraction of ions that uh, we sample from those that are available that even go into the instrument because uh, if uh, particular peptides are over a period of five, 10 seconds, we sample it only for hundreds of milliseconds or maybe for a second. Uh, and the, the sharper those solution peaks are, the, the more efficiently we can sample um, a larger fraction of, of the peptides. So we think it's both on the side of robustness of the front end and, uh, and increased ionization efficiency in increased delivery of peptides to the instrument in the form of ions that uh, many of the significant gains can be made in terms of uh, sensitivity and usability. Um, and, and probably finally, um, a bit more of a, a question about the field in general. 
when you hear of a statement, something like the, the power of proteomics, um, you know, what, is, what does this statement mean to you? What's the, what is the power of proteomics? Well, it's a very broad statement. It's to understand life. Life is a dance of protein interactions. And if we cannot measure those interactions, if we cannot follow that dance, we cannot understand it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Look, um, look, I'd really like to, to thank you for your time today. Um, it's been really insightful and it's been uh, great to, to be able to understand uh, your specific field of research and, and your thoughts on the, the field um, more broadly and some of the, the you know, ideas on the technological and, and analytical advances uh, that are to come. Um, yeah, really thankful for, for joining us and it's uh, been amazing. Thank you, Jared. I hope that you enjoyed this Power of Proteomics interview with Associate Professor Nikolai Slavov. If you want to find out more about single cell proteomics, don't forget to register for the Single Cell Conference happening mid-August. For more information, go to single-cell.net. And finally, keep an eye on our website and social channels for more interviews with some of the leaders in the proteomics field.